so for me, um, I, I, whenever I'm asked to do something like this, I always have a look at the syllabuses from, or syllabi from all over the country. And I notice that there is content in relation to the balance of payments in every senior economic syllabus. Um, generally things like, and you'll all be familiar with this, you know, the components, the factors affecting the recent trends and the links between the, what we call the, the capital account and the CAF, we just talk about the CAFA, the current and financial account. Um, it also includes some consideration of exchange rates and usually there's some link to the terms of trade and the, the influence of um, exchange rates and the on the balance of payments and um, the current account what used to be a deficit. We actually had deficit specified in our syllabus until a year ago when it was corrected. Um, and we changed it to the current account balance because clearly we haven't had a current, we don't have a current account deficit any longer. So what I've observed students struggle with, um, sometimes they struggle with classifying transactions. I still have students say, you know, say to me, but hang on a sec, that wouldn't be there. You would record that somewhere else in the balance payments. And that is something that perhaps a multiple choice question on an exam might ask them to do. Um, and the relationships between the different um, balance payment subaccounts and components, in particular, the relationship between the capital and financial account and the net, net incomes account, um, and also uh, how they offset each other or how they mirror each other, how different factors will influence the, um, the, the balance of payments outcomes of the different components and then how the two sides of the balance of payments and not being an accountant by training, I had to have the whole double entry thing explained to me several times. Uh, and then um, reading charts, I think some of the things that students struggle with in terms of charts are making sure that they're actually making sense of what the chart is telling them by, under, by making sure they're reading the chart in the correct way. Does it tell me about percentage change? Does it tell me about growth? Does it tell me about volume? Does it tell me about value? And in fact, in Tim's presentation, you would have noticed there were charts that showed you all of those different things. And so if students aren't reading those accurately and carefully, then, then they're actually going to make a lot of errors when they're confronted with that kind of data in an exam or an assessment situation. And our exams sometimes have calculations as well. Um, and so again, another one that students might struggle with. So what I've decided to offer you um, is a few different activities. Uh, analyzing balance of payments data, I've actually taken a lot of the uh, charts that, that Tim provided us with, or not a lot of them, but a few, and talked about how we could link them to the different parts of our syllabus. Um, classification activities, I haven't, the handouts haven't actually been photocopied for you, but they are electronically available after this session, and they're numbered, you know, handout one, handout two, and those are referenced on the slides for you. Um, in the Victorian syllabus, we talk about the structural versus the cyclical changes to the current account balance in particular. Um, I'm not sure how you think about that here in New South Wales or up in Queensland or in South Australia, WA, Tassie, um, but we tend to focus on uh, the, the net primary incomes balance as being a bit of a reflection of the more structural features of our economy in terms of us being net borrowers for a long time, net capital inflow, and the trade balance as being more of a cons consequence of cyclical features of our economy and the global economy. Um, and then I did have some links to potential exam questions. They're actually at the end of the slides because I was told, which always happens, that I'd over-prepared and done too many slides and we had to cut some out. So they are still there, but we may not get to them, but they are there. Um, a a guided, guided reading and comprehension task. So Tim worked with a colleague to write an article that actually encompassed quite a lot of what you talked about today. Um, but for many students, confronting an article like that is almost impossible. So a colleague of mine, um, a lovely young teacher, who actually teaches at school where Lucy Alice went to high school. He's the economics teacher there now. He's written, he wrote an article and he said I was very welcome to distribute it to people here, uh, which was extracting key elements and interspersing it with questions and reflection as you went through so that students were able to read that article without feeling completely overwhelmed by, by the content. Um, some stuff on changing trade patterns and a few activities on exchange rates. So let's start with this, this diagram. This is taken from the RBA Balance of Payments Explainer. Now, 
there'll be a few show and tells today. Some of these are outside and you'll be able to help yourself to them. Others are all available on the, very easily accessible on the RBA education page. This is a fabulous document in that it answered quite a lot of questions for me and I would, I, I, I would start by talking about in terms of the relationship between the current account and the balance and the capital and financial account balance, I would show them this stylized balance of payments start, uh, diagram. So it makes it very clear that if you're going to have a credit on the um, capital and financial account, then you're going to have to have a similarly mirroring debit on the current account balance. Now, that's not what our current account and capital account look like at the moment. So I would show that diagram to my students and I would say to them, now I want you to redraw that balance of payments diagram to reflect recent developments. What's, it, what's the current situation? And they could do that by using this diagram from, Chris, from um, Tim's presentation, where you've actually got as percentages of nominal GDP, the recent data on the capital and financial account balance and the current account balance getting them to think about that idea that they are offsetting each other, adding up to zero, mirroring each other, as Tim was talking about. Um, <clears throat> also, un use it to unpack Tim's observation that Australia has been a net importer of capital for most of our history. And now, we, in recent years, we've been less so. And so as a result, we've ended up with a capital and financial account balance that's a deficit and a current account surplus. Um, I would also ask students to return to the circular flow model in our economy, in our very basic early times we're talking about that idea that in an economy we have the leakages of savings and those are then used for investment but if your savings as Tim has observed are, go are less than your investment then you're going to need capital inflow. You're going to need financial inflow money coming in from overseas. Um, and talking about the idea that the financial account is recording that inflow. I particularly like this diagram from Tim's presentation as well. And where he talks about, where he, he shows us that the investment and sa the relationship between investment and saving and the, how that's reflected in the current account balance. So again, I would be showing this to my students and talking about the changes in those, th this is where we come to that idea of structural versus cyclical um, influences on our current account balance. The idea that over time, as our savings patterns have changed, as we have become better at saving through superannuation and those superannuation funds have been invested overseas, then over time, as our savings has exceeded our, our investment, we can see very clearly the move into a current account surplus. I would again get students to annotate that, marking up the chart, and ask them to explain why. And I think, Tim, you did a great job of explaining those key features, one being the changes in our trade, and also the changes in our savings versus investment behaviour, the decline in the investment since the end of the mining boom and the increase in saving over that period. Uh, another fantastic chart highlighting the relationship between the current account balance and the trade balance. Um, I think for some students, when they see, I know for myself, when I present my students with the four sub-accounts sub of, of the current account, and they just start to, you know, their brains start to fry. You can see it in front of you. And they, they sort of start to fade. And you say, well, actually, what, what often happens with the way this data is recorded is it's compressed into two key elements. One is trade, so the balance on merchandise trade plus the net services sub-accounts, and the net primary incomes and net secondary income sub-accounts of the current account. And when you can then present this to the students and show them how clear it is that if you add together the orange line and the blue line, you'll get the green line. They can then see how those pieces are fitting together to get to that current account balance. Now, the other question that our students are getting asked in exams is what's causing this? And that was what Tim was unpacking. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. but. Um, that, that 
uh, why has our trade, Im trade balance improved so substantially? What could in the future actually cause our trade balance to worsen? Have there been times when our income balance has improved? And I find that point in when we see our income balance almost get to zero, <laughs> so close. Because one of the things I've always noticed on this, this diagram when I present, or similar diagrams when I've presented it to my students over the years, is that for such a very long time, our trade balance was nowhere near, our trade surplus was nowhere near sufficient to offset that income balance deficit. When you added the two together, the, the green line was still below zero for such a long time. It didn't matter how strong our trade was. But something has shifted. And as Tim's highlighted for us, one of the things that's shifted is that our exports are worth so much more now in terms of the commodity prices, but also we are exporting so much more since, since that increased capacity as a result of the, the investment during the mining boom. <clears throat> and one of the things about charts is they do tell a story. I look at that chart and I can see what's been happening in the Australian economy. I don't think there'd be many kids who couldn't tell you what's happened to commodities, why commodities are important in the Australian economy. And if um, I'd forgotten that they made up 70% of our exports, <laughs> that is a massive contribution. Um, another, uh, another diagram, that I took this from the Trends in Australia's Balance of Payments, which is a slightly more recent, I think, is that correct? Slightly more recent publication. This one is the explainer about the balance of payments. This one's the trends and what's been causing. And I got the sense that a lot of that was drawn from the work that you were doing in those articles. Um, again, asking them to, heart, to, to describe what they can see in the chart, reading the chart very carefully and asking them to talk about how is it going to impact the Australian dollar exchange rate, potentially, and how would that, that recent change in Australia's CAFA balance have impacted the current account balance? And what does it mean, sorry, there's this typo there, what it means for the Australian economy? And as Tim or has already explained to us, it impacts on Australia's net international investment position. I think you referred to it as net foreign liability position? Yeah. Um, because it, um, in terms of our net foreign debt and our net foreign equity. Particularly love this chart too. Again, asking students, what's happened in each of these flows? What does, what does the yellow bar actually mean? and get them to annotate the chart. What are we talking about when we're talking about direct investment into the Australian economy? What does it mean when the yellow bar is above zero? What does it mean when the yellow bar is below zero? Well, as Tim's made very clear in his presentation, the yellow bar being above zero makes it very clear that for quite a long time through the 2000s, there was very substantial inflow of direct investment into the Australian economy to build that mining capacity by and large. And then more recently, as a consequence of the outflow of, of the end of that, that um, ex extreme period and the, uh, in, what would the word be, insecurities related to the COVID pandemic and the outflow of direct investment out of Australia, but also that yellow bar, I, that story of superannuation is a massive one for the Australian economy. Um, I've, I've heard it explained as we can't actually find enough places to put all the money that we have saved. I think the last time I checked was at $3 trillion in superannuation. That's all of us in here, all of our investment, our savings for our, our future retirement. And that needs a home. And it's chasing a home by leaving the country and going somewhere else, or it's also getting better returns than you can get in Australia. Um, identify the causes of the changes in these. Massive investment in superannuation, withdrawal of the direct investment from the mining boom. And identify where the capital flows would be recorded in the balance of payments. Quick quiz. 
you know, in the classroom? Where would it be recorded? Oh, um, the financial account, Ms. Brennan, direct investment, portfolio investment. And have students identify one credit and one debit transaction. That, you, that would be one of those blue or yellow, would include it in one of those blue or yellow bars. Make it real for them. You know, BHP opens up a new mine somewhere. Um, Rio Tinto invests in Australia. And then obviously, thinking about the longer term implications as the flows start to flow, as we, get, as we start to get um, the payments of income on those portfolio and those overseas portfolio investments, how are they going to be recorded in the current account? They're going to be recorded as, as credits in the net primary incomes. How are they going to be, how, how are the direct investment, con the consequences of the direct investment overseas or in Australia going to be recorded in the, in the in, or influence the current account over time as a, as, an, as a flow? Well, it's going to be in the form of dividends, profits, flowing offshore, onshore. Uh, again, um, one thing that Lucy said this morning that I, that I love the way she said, there's several things. She said, if they know what net means, <laughs> if they know real versus nominal, and there was one other thing, flows versus stocks, and percentage changes versus levels. Thank you, yes, thank you. Um, importance of net, asking them to make like get get them to make sure they understand the difference between the gross level for example of Australia's foreign debt or foreign equity and the net level really important to press impress that upon them again that's taken from the trends in Australia's balance of payments Okay, now this is an activity. Like I said, not all the, uh, the activities actually aren't in, aren't in your um, packs, but you'll be able to get them immediately after the session. <coughs> Classifying transactions in the balance of payments. First option is that you just distribute this table and then have students actually annotate how these transactions would, or how and where these transactions would be recorded like a series of multiple choice questions. For example, you know, would it be recorded in the current, uh, current account or the capital and financial account? Which sub-account of the current account or capital and financial account would the transaction be recorded in? And would it be recorded as a credit or a debit? So the first one, I, I have this absolute desire to have people yell out the answers, but I won't, I promise. Um, you know, Warren Buffett buys 20,000 Telstra shares. Um, Qantas sells an old aircraft to Malaysian air Airlines for $10 million. The RBA sells Australian dollars in an attempt to stabilise the value of the Australian currency. Um, you take a holiday job in New Zealand and have your wages paid into your NAB bank account. So you're asking students to classify those transactions according to where they would be, where and how they would be recorded in the balance of payments. Another possibility is a balance of payments poster task, which is the other option. So this is actually asking them to create a, t a poster of the balance of payments with the different sub accounts in it, and then graphically represent those, each of those transactions. So this is great for those kids like mine on a Friday afternoon, you've got double economics, last two periods Friday afternoon. Everyone just wants to cut up bits of paper, get out the glue and stick them all down. And it's a way of them working in groups, but actually being focused. <laughs> and then they get to argue about it. So that's one of my favourite things to do is getting the kids to actually do this stuff and then convince each other why that kid over there is wrong or why that one over there is right. So, and um, I, I actually, I do do these things in my classroom, obviously. Um, and I do find that cutting up bits of paper and sticking them down is, is quite an effective task, quite regularly. <clears throat> oh, and if the students are having trouble working out where those transactions would be recorded, send them back to the, the balance of payments explainer. You know, does it fit these criteria? You know, is it this kind of transaction? Is it that kind of transaction? That will help them for sure. Now, this is the guided reading task. Um, so, like I said, Tim and his colleague, Nicole, wrote a wonderful article. Um, but again, a bit daunting. I read it, but a bit daunting for 17-year-olds. For so my lovely colleague, Chris Bush, who works at University Heights, 
<clears throat> sent me this and I said to him, uh, Chris, is it okay if I share this with other people? And what it is, he hasn't actually changed a single word. I think he's taken a few things out. And, but he's, what he's done is inserted some pictures. Always good to have pictures. Very important to have pictures in, in high school. And also a series of questions that students work their way through as they, as they progress through the article. And then some summary questions at the end. And it includes things like, um, you know, unpacking the reasons why certain things have happened. It takes the charts. Some of the charts we've got here today, um, but the ones here today are probably a bit updated relative to this because this article is just over 12 months old. And it actually asks the students to work their way through that um, and read sections. You could read it together. You could get them to read it to each other. Um, why would we do this? Well, economic literacy and familiarity with the kinds of things they're going to have to read out there in the world. This is real world stuff. This is what's actually happening. So why not expose them to it in a, in a relatively easily digestible way? Okay. Um, another thing Lucy spoke about this morning, I couldn't believe it, I was sitting there thinking, these are all the things I'm going to talk about, net versus gross, stock versus flow. It's important to remind the, different, the students the difference between the flows that are recorded in the current account because I think what some of my students, I know they get quite confused about the idea that the current account is a snapshot, of, a snapshot of what's happened over a period of time as distinct from something like the net foreign debt or net foreign equity position, position net foreign liabilities position um, of our economy, is a, is a snapshot of an actual point in time. It's where the levels are as distinct from the balance of the transactions that have happened over a period of time. And getting them to understand that, getting them to understand the difference between that flow and stock is really important for the students, but also understanding that they can influence each, that they do influence each other. Um, and a reminder that those, the balance of payments really is about the transactions that have happened in a, in a period of time, those three months, and that the net foreign liabilities and in terms of the net foreign debt and the net foreign equity are about the stocks and assets and liabilities at a point in time. Just a couple of things on trade. Tim sort of spoke a little bit about this, but not much, not in that much detail. I think this diagram, which is this is actually taken directly from um, Trends in Australia's Balance of Payments, is fantastic. And it's a really good example of how hard it is to make sense and really get a fantastic, an easy to see impression of, of a change over time with just a table of numbers. I would give this to my kids, I would get them to feed it into an Excel spreadsheet and I'd get them to plot a series of overlapping, uh, overlapping lines as, as a line graph chart. Watching Australia's trading partners in terms of where our exports go, go from 48% in the 1900s to the UK to 4% in the 2020s and, at, and the other extreme from 1% to mainland China in the 1900s to 35% in the 2020s. I look at that table of data and I think, mm, I don't know about that. I, you know, it's great, but um, really it doesn't jump off the page at me, but a chart would jump off the page at me. It's an opportunity for them to learn how to use Excel and plot, plot, plot a couple of couple of charts. Um, you can also get the same information for Australia's import sources, where our imports come from. Um, the other one I really liked, did you show this one? Not today, but it's from that balance of payments trends. Yeah, again, this is from Tim's article about trends in the balance of payments. The changing composition of Australia's exports over time. Um, I think that um, the role of services is, is really interesting in how important it had become and then how quickly it has declined, but also the significance obviously of resources. We all know that, but being able to actually see that and the decline of agriculture as a percentage of our exports is just, I, I just guess I just find it kind of gobsmacking. This is another one. Um, 
I think Lucy spoke about this this morning and in, in terms of the consequences for Australia of the slowdown of the other economies around the globe other than just China. So advanced economies demand is still very significant for Australia's exports. Australia still catches a cold when the, U when the US starts to sneeze. But there is something of a change in that the reason for that has, has shifted. It's not that they directly buy from us, it's that they buy from people who buy from us. And getting kids to see this in a stylized way from that explainer about the trends in Australia's balance of payments, the idea that those non-Asian economies have declined as destinations for our, our exports directly, but they are a really important source of indirect demand. So yes, of course, the, U, the UK only now buys 4% of our exports, but that's not because they're not, an important, they're not important in our exports. They buy their exports from China and Singapore and Bangladesh and India to where we export our raw materials. <clears throat> um, the terms of trade. Hands up if your students struggle with the terms of trade. Okay. Hands up if they want to say things like, the value of Australia's exports. Yes? Okay. Um, what I particularly like about these two graphs that, that Tim presented to us before is it shows very clearly that there are two key contributors to Australia's surging trade surplus. One is the volume of our exports. The other is the price of our exports. In the new VCA curriculum, we specify clearly that students need to understand what affects the terms of trade. And one of the examples we give is commodity prices. In fact, from what I can tell from that graph, in fact, I think the terms of trade is commodity prices. Am I right? <laughs> More or less, close enough. Yeah, so I've, I've actually never seen the RBA index of commodity prices and the terms of trade plotted on the same chart before. I usually just put them together next to each other on, a, on the same diagram from the chart pack. But it's a great way of kids understanding that what we're talking about here is prices, not volumes, but it does influence values. And if they're going to talk about the impact of the terms of trade on the current account, they really need to be talking about either the impact of the terms of trade in terms of its increase in the value of our exports if we were to hold the volume of our exports at the same level, or at least acknowledging the reality of what's happening is that the volume of exports is rising, but at the same time the price is rising. So you bring those two together and you see a very rapid increase in the value of our exports. I think one of the challenges for the terms of trade is that students want to go straight from price to value without recognising that you can get an increase in the value of your exports through an increase in the terms of trade, even if there's no change in the volume of your exports. Um, so I would be spending a bit of time with those charts and unpacking them for students. So I'd be asking them, you know, identify the trend in the terms of trade over that time. Have them explain one demand and one supply factor. Um, students that I teach are very tempted to talk about the supply factor being the rise in commodity prices. And I have to give them a quick smack and say, no, that's not actually the factor. That's what's happening. You're telling me that the, the prices of exports are rising because the prices of exports are rising. You need to be telling me something like demand in China or the collapse of um, exports of um, fuel from Russia after the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the imp imposition of sanctions. You could talk about the collapse of wheat exports from Ukraine. Um, but you have to tell me an actual factor that rather than just the prices. The prices have changed because the prices have changed. And again, the impact on uh, the current account balance. So I think I've probably got time very quickly to just quickly rush through my exchange rates. Okay, students also struggle with exchange rates, no surprise there. This is a very, very, very simple task. So what this task does, I start this with my, uh, to be honest, I do this with my year 10s when we're t learning about trade. Most of my students actually think that 
or they seem to think that when the Australian dollar, Australia, Australia's currency value changes, when our exchange rate falls, we get less for our exports. Or when our dollar appreciates, people overseas get less for what they are exporting to us. So what this activity actually asks them to do, and again, you'll, you'll find these are being distributed electronically, is asking them to work out, to do some very basic calculations. If I buy a pair of jeans from overseas at this price, this, this US dollar price, what will I pay for them if the Australian dollar is at a certain level? Then it falls and then it rises. So it depreciates and appreciates. And then it asks the students, so do the people in the US get any less money or more money for that pair of jeans? And all of a sudden they think, ah, oh, no, because of course the exchange rate only operates at the border. It means that we have to buy, we have to pay more to buy the same amount of something else. But getting them to understand that idea of the exchange rate as a relative price can be very hard for a lot of students. So this is a, like I said, it's a very simplistic task. It may be way below a lot of your students, but it's certainly not below mine. They really do struggle with getting, getting that, their head around that idea that the exchange rate affects the desirability of our exports and how much we have to pay for imports. But it doesn't actually affect how much we get when we do sell something and how much people overseas get when we buy something from them. <clears throat> Another activity I would encourage you to do, um, if you haven't accessed the drivers of the Australian dollar exchange rate, you need to go and download it immediately. The diagrams are superb. They are a really simple, um, stylization of the key factors that influence the Australian dollar and things like how does the terms of trade influence the Australian dollar exchange rate, how, does, uh, how do relative interest rates and the interest rate differential in particular um, influence that. I would, I, would be, uh, I would be talking through using these diagrams to talk through to my students the main influences on the Australian dollar. And there's actually diagrams for well, the long term versus short term drivers. There's a diagram for commodity prices, interest rate differentials, changes in trade volumes. And then there's a discussion of some of the short term drivers like speculation. Is that correct, Tim? Include speculation, yeah. Okay. I would then be asking students to write up a few scenarios. Give me a scenario that would create demand for or supply of the Australian dollar and then illustrate that in a demand and supply diagram. I'm not sure if your students have to draw demand and supply diagrams for the Forex market, um, but I certainly find them useful to show to students. Um, there are two sheets that, I, that I've provided. One is a series of scenarios. And the other one is just a couple of, a couple of other scenarios to do with um, exchange rate transactions. Um, this one's interesting in terms of this, this diagram actually talks about the idea that um, what will happen when there's an increase in Australia's interest rates relative to the rest of the world. But we all know that at the moment our interest rate differential is shrinking. So we might be raising our target cash rate, but the differential of exchange of interest rates across the globe is actually shrinking because other central banks are raising their cash rates faster. Um, so get them to do this for a decrease in the differential. So in other words, what is happening at the moment, the RBA raises the target cash rate, but the Fed raises by more as per our current situation. I found it really interesting today to hear Lucy say the exchange rate channel is working in terms of the transmission mechanism of monetary policy because the dollar is higher than it would be even though it's depreciated. Had the RBA not increased the cash rate to the level the target cash rate as high as it has, our dollar would be even lower. 